So hello everybody one more time. Henry Sevilla recording here. And uh, in today's lesson, we're going to be speaking a little bit about stress, rhythm, and probably just a little bit about intonation in English. Um, my talk is based on the chapter Stress, Rhythm, and Intonation at Word Level by Luz Marina Vasquez. Um, and, and let's dive in. What I'm going to start doing here is giving you some key definitions before we go right into the anthology of your course in order to, to speak about more specific examples you have there. So first things first, all right? What is stress? When we talk about stress, we're basically speaking about the pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables, uh, which can happen both at the word and phrase level. So take a look at these examples. The word funeral is stressed on the first syllable, but there is a stress shift when you have the adjective funereal. So you have also the noun verb homograph such subject subject. So you have, for example, increase, increase. And so that is word stress. But like I said, stress can also happen at the, at the phrase and sentence level. And when we put it all together, we will be, we're speaking about rhythm, which is the next topic we're going to cover. Now, stress, when we speak about stress in English, we have primary, secondary, and also tertiary stress. Uh, but we're not going to be talking about tertiary stress. So, but we are certainly going to need to talk a little bit about primary and secondary stress. Think about a word such as communicatability, which is a very technical word that means basically the degree to which you are able to convey message that communicates. So communicatability has the main stress on the commu communicatability on the sixth syllable. This is the primary stress, but it also has a secondary stress on the second syllable. So you, you don't say communicability, but you say communicatability with a bigger stress or, or, or a more prominent stress on the sixth syllable. The same is true for words ending in A, T, I, O, N, such as compensation. So you don't say compensation like that. You say compensation. So you say more or less slowly so that you can achieve secondary stress here, but primary stress will fall on the syllable before the last one. Just a quick, uh, call it a heads up on, on, on stress. What is rhythm? Rhythm is simply the combination of stressed and unstressed words in a sentence or in a phrase. Uh, take a look at this one. This is the beginning of the sentence. I have to go to school. So notice how my main words are here, uh, have, go, and school. And as a matter of fact, this is pretty much the way children talk when they're just, you know, little, little kids. Uh, baby talk is like that. So I have to go to school. That means if I delete the I and two and two here, you would still get the message. If I'm speaking to you from a distance and all you hear is have, go, school, you would still get the message. Another example is there has to be a way. Notice how my main, my mainly stressed words are has and way. In, in when, when I'm contrasting two elements in a sentence, it might be the case that I emphasize two or three elements, such as in, she is taller than me, right? She's taller than me, because I'm interested in contrasting she versus me. Here's another example. This is the, the, a type of poetry that, as I understand, was invented or at least popularized in Ireland. It's called a limerick, and it's a type of nursery rhyme that's supposed to be silly or funny, but they're great to practice rhythm. So check it out. It goes like this. Uh, you can clap with me. It goes, I knew a man whose name was Shaw. He ate a rock and broke his jaw. What do you think? He said with a wink, perhaps it's bad to eat them raw. So that's rhythm. Notice how I'm reducing everything here. I don't say I knew because I would sound angry, but I say I knew a man whose name was Shaw. He ate a rock and broke his jaw. Notice how I reduce he, a, and his. The others are, are, are important words. This, the, the, one, the, the words that stand out are called content words, and the words that I am able to reduce are called function words. I'll talk more about this when I jump into the anthology. So that is basically rhythm. Here, here are more examples uh, on how you can achieve rhythm. When you have a perfect pattern such as Stressed and weak, this is what it stands for. S W S W S W is stress weak, stress weak, stressed and weak syllables. You have things like twinkle, twinkle, little star, 
Let me help you find your keys. Don't forget the bread and milk. Tell me why you don't agree. How I wonder what you are. Find this pace and park your car. Thanks a lot for all your help. Don't forget to leave a tip. Of course, these are random sentences that were put together for the, for the sake of, of, of the explanation on, on rhythm. In an ideal world, this is what you do, stressed and unstressed. But in the real world, in the cold splash of reality, you will find more than just stressed and unstressed. Sometimes you have stressed, stressed, and unstressed, or sometimes you will have unstressed, 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 and something stressed. So, but the bottom line here is that you should be able to, to reduce or almost delete function words, words that are grammatically important, but for the purpose of pronunciation, not so important. Now, what is intonation? In the ontology, we're not talking a lot about intonation, but I want to give you a quick glimpse at it. Intonation is the way the speaker's voice goes up and down as they speak, and this is going to be covered in a course that you will take, which is called phonology. For now, I would be satisfied if we know that there are basically two ways in which you can do intonation. There are actually many, many, many ways, but for now, I would be satisfied with these two. You can have rise in intonation or fall in intonation. Usually in US American English, uh, yes, no questions suffer or undergo rise in intonation, such as, did you like the game? Oh, did you see Charles? Um, are you here for the, uh, for the car? Are you here for the class? That's rise in intonation because there is a rise at the end of your sentence. This one is the WH question because it begins with, with where and it has fallen intonation. It means it falls at the end. So you say, where did he go? You fall at the end. Or where's the box? So you fall at the end. And also that is, all, that, that is also the case in statements. You usually have fallen intonation. I'm here to break the good news. You can hear how I fall at the end. Of course, when you take more advanced courses on, on phonology and super segmentals, you will see that there is something called uh, echo questions and you will see that there is something called information questions and all of this breaks the basic rules of intonation. But again, because this is just an intro to the basic concepts of stress, rhythm and intonation, then I would be happy if you, uh, if you know that there is rising and falling intonation. How is, what are, what else are we go, going to cover in this video? Uh, based on the anthology by Luz Marina Vasquez, we're going to be covering more for phonological processes and sentence stress. So let me go right into it. So on chapter six on your anthologies, you will find some facts. Um, and uh, the first fact that I want to talk about here is that word stress, speaking specifically about word stress, it depends a lot on the historical origin of the word, on affixation, which is, you know, affixation is basically the prefixes and the suffixes that we add to words and the grammatical function that they play. Um, so you will notice in this presentation and in books that you will read in the future that the majority of two syllable words that come from Germanic languages, that means the Scandinav Scandinavian languages that make, that ended up fusing together to form English, whatever two syllable words coming from Germanic languages, they're usually stressed on the first syllable. You have words such as father, sister, yellow, often, bottle, finger, wisdom, elbow, water. They're stressed in the first in the first syllable because of historical reasons. Don't, don't ask me why at the moment we would have to talk to a historical linguist to talk more, you know, more confidently about this. But for now, let's just keep in mind that words of Germanic origin that happen to be two syllable words are usually stressed on the first syllable. Many French words um, have entered the English language and they have assimilated the same pattern. And so you have things like picture, flower, foreign, music, doctor, visit. They are French words because there was, allow me to digress a little bit here. In the 11th century, in England, or what was formerly called Britannia, there was something called the Norman Conquest. Uh, you know, the Duke of Normandy conquered Britannia, and then for about three centuries, the French, they brought, they, they conquered Britannia, and, and of course, uh, they came into contact with the settlers uh, in Britannia, and of course, they gave them a lot of uh, input from French. And this is the reason that we have so many words in English that look like French or that look like Spanish or like Latin, because remember that French is a, is a, is a Romance language. 
French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian, they're the Romance language. They, that means that they are the languages that somehow come from the Latin language that was spoken in the Roman Empire. Okay, that digression aside, let me dive directly into morphophonological processes. And so um, let's talk about morphemes. What a, what's a morpheme? It's a little something, to put it in very mundane terms, it's a little something that you add to a word. So you have, for example, the, word, the, the root act. So you can add a prefix or you can add a suffix. You can say, for example, react. The root is act, but you're adding a prefix re, so then you have react. Uh, and then you, you can add a suffix, I-O-N, and, and have reaction. So those are morphemes, little things that you attach at the beginning or in the middle uh, or at the end of words. What happens when we add a prefix to the base form of a word? As a general rule, nothing happens in terms of, I mean, of course, a lot happens. But in terms of word stress, not a lot happens. So the, the words keep um, the, the main stress. The base word, word keep the main stress. So you have a word, surprise, complained, unhealthy. Notice how health is the base form. You have a prefix, un, and you have a suffix. So unhealthy, we keep the base form, asleep, incredible, declare, explain, forget. And again, this is almost always true with prefixes of Germanic origin. There are some prefixes, we're probably not going to be talking about these prefixes here, but there are some prefixes that, that, that do change the, the stress in a word. Normally, prefix, prefixes are, uh, are unstressed. So you have undo, unleash, outdo, and so on. If we move on to the next page, you will see what I was talking about, the exceptions. Um, the exceptions include forearm, forecast, outlook, output, overalls, overpass, underwear, underpass, upstart, uproar, which is chaos. Now, um, then we're talking here about something called noun verb homographs. A homograph, if you break the word down into two, you will see that homo means the same, graph means writing or spelling. So homograph, a homograph is a word that is spelled in the same way, but which but which means a different a different thing. So you have things like Force, foresee, and in this case, foresight, and foresee as a verb. So he has a lot of foresight. Can you foresee it happening? Again, forearm and forearm, forearmed. So I'm going to read this, the pairs of sentences for you. He was wounded in the forearm, right? The forearm. And then we have the saying here, forewarned is forearmed. And that means in Spanish, en guerra avisada, no muere soldado. That's how you say it in English. One more time. Forewarned is forearmed. The next one says the truck carried an overload. Versus don't overload the pack of animals. So he's working on a diffi difficult project versus they project that it will take six weeks. Fresh produce, with an, an accent on the first syllable, fresh, fresh produce is expensive versus the new company will produce a lot. And then you have thousands of words like this. No, probably not thousands, but you definitely have dozens of words like this, like these in English. Now, suffixes. The suffix is the one thing that comes at the end of a word. They can affect word, word stress in three ways. There could be no effect at all. They may receive strong stress themselves. And also they may cause the stress pattern in the stem or in the base form to switch from one syllable to another. And I will show you how. Um, so for example, threaten, nothing happens. Baker, nothing happens. Um, so overall, like I was saying, neutral suffixes of Germanic origin, they do not affect the word, uh, you know, teacher and manhood. Nothing happens really in the base word. However, suffixes of French origin often cause the final syllable of a word to receive strong stress, uh, with other syllables receiving light stress or no stress at all. Uh, this is the case of, in words such as millionaire and refugee and questionnaire and trustee and engineer and volunteer and Lebanese and Vietnamese and boutique and technique, picturesque and grotesque, masseur, um, and balloon, and so on. So these are, if you notice, they look like Spanish, right? 
boutique looks like boutique, Vietnamese looks like Vietnamita, Lebanese looks like Libanese. Um, so again, Spanish and French, they're pretty much related because they are they are Romance languages. And so whenever you have, ad, uh, not adjectives, I'm sorry, whenever you ha have suffixes of French origin or of Latin origin, then the stress is modified. All right, so there you have more examples. I also want to speak about this. Some suffixes might also cause a shift in stress in the root words, such as in. Check this out. This is exciting. You have the noun courage versus courageous. I'm sorry, I'm skipping one. So you have advantage versus the adjective advantageous. So this happens when you have a noun and you have an adjective. Not all the time, but again, in these particular cases, in these very specific cases, you have photo and then you have photography, proverb, proverbial, you have Paris, Parisian, and then you have climate and climatic, ecology, ecological, um, injure, injurious, tranquil, tranquility, educate, and education. Alrighty, this is what I was talking about before, noun, verb, homographs. And we have a bigger list here. I'm going to just read it for you. So you have the noun, which usually receives the stress on the first syllable, and the verb, which usually receives the stress on the second syllable. There are a few exceptions, but, uh, but I'm going to read it for you anyways. Record, record, conduct, conduct, addict, addict, protest, protest, um, progress, progress. Permit, permit, increase, increase, conflict, conflict, desert, desert, contract, contract, object, object, subject, subject, convict, convict, and so on and so forth. Um, the rest you will be able to read on your own. Here is an exercise that you will do at home. Uh, what you have to do here is practice reading the shift in, the, in these exercises and circle or underline or highlight the stress syllable. I'm going to do the first one for you. Jennifer Lope is recorded in your record this year. So what you do is highlight or underline the stress syllable in each pair. All right. Now, this is very interesting and also very important. In adjectives and nouns, the A-T-E suffix is reduced to it. Be very careful here. But in verbs, the A-T-E suffix is pronounced eight. Of course, this results in a longer syllable in the case of the verb. So I'm going to pronounce these very carefully and slowly for you. You have the noun or adjective. In this case, it's, a, it's an adjective. Graduate. Graduate. It, it, it at the end. Versus the verb graduate. Graduate. So you can say things like, he's a graduate student. An adjective, graduate, it, 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 he's a graduate student. He graduated, aided last year. Separate versus separate. So an example is put these two things on a separate container, separate container, separate, versus you need to separate the containers. Estimate, estimate, uh, duplicate, duplicate, approximate, approximate. I'm going to give you two examples here. Uh, this is the approximate amount versus uh, the amount approximates a lot. Alternate, alternate. Moderate, moderate. Appropriate, appropriate. Elaborate, elaborate. Deliberate, deliberate. Example, that was a deliberate attack on the candidate. So one more time, that was a deliberate it attack on the candidate versus the candidates are deliberating. Notice my exaggeration in the diphthong. So you have a lot of words like these. And so it's very important that you check them out and, you know, memorize them. Other examples of stress shift include between refrigeration and to refrigerate or refrigerator, operation and operate, congratulations and congratulate, um, assassination and assassin, celebration and celebrating, approximation and approximately, or approximate. Um, consideration versus considerate or considerately. In this exercise, what you're going to do, guys, is circle or underline the stress syllable in the italized words. These are the, uh, these are the italized words, conducting and conduct, uh, rebelled and 
increase because this is a noun. So do that at home and we will check this out later on. Other examples of stress shift depending on work function include, check this out, it depends on, on the grammatical role that the word is playing. So photograph, this is a noun. Photography, this is still a noun, but it's different. And photographer, this is still a noun, but it's the person who takes the photos. Versus photographic, uh, this is an adjective, right? Again, we have telegraph, telegraphy, telegrapher, and telegraphic. Democrat, democracy, democratic, diplomat, diplomacy, diplomatic, uh, politics, political, politically, politician, personal, personify, personification, personality. So crazy, right? Competent, competitor, competitively, competition, family, familiar, familiarly, and familiarity, right? And for, almost finally, we have compounds in English, and this is very important also. In English, all the comp for all compounds, the first element is always stress. So you have things like blackbird, so email. It's always going to be stressed on the first element of the compound. So blackbird, hot dog, airplane, tap dance, cowboy, mailbox, and not mailbox, right? So sunshine and not sunshine, all right? Careful with that, cowboy, hometown, mailman. In adjective compounds, it's same story. Well-trained, lime green, good looking. Same story with verb compounds. So house it, uh, typewrite, lip read, tiptoe, handcuff, hand drive, handprint. With reflexives, the story is different. With reflexive pronouns, the stress is always going to be on the second syllable or, or at the end of the reflexive. So you have themselves, myself, yourself, himself, and so on. And here is a tip for you. Um, read it carefully and let me know if you have any questions. Because I'm actually just going to read the first one because there are a lot of uh, you know recommendations here that you will be able to process on your own. A useful way to organize words regarding stress patterns is by identifying the number of syllables plus the syllable where the main stress falls. Um, so, for example, uh, I'm going to read the third one. Record, ignore, attend, hotel, pretend, and construct. So all of these are two-syllable words that receive the stress on the second syllable. That's why it's called 2-2 or 2.2. It means two-syllable words, they receive the stress on the second, on the second syllable. Uh, if you check example number, what is it, number six, they are three syllable words which receive the stress on the third syllable. So you have picturesque, grotesque, volunteer, engineer, questionnaire, and so on. Go ahead and read the rest of the examples and see if you have any questions. This exercise is about classifying the words according to the pattern just described above, you know, this one here and, and the other uh, eight questions. So describe if they are, for example, 1.1 1, 1, 1. 1 or 2.1 or 2.2 or 3.2 or 3.3, 4.1, 4 4.2 or 5.3. And the second part that I said we were going to be talking about was sentence stress. We have just finished talking about morphophonological processes. With sentence stress, I talked about it a little bit. Uh, just a quick obs observation here. Spanish has a syllable level stress. And in Spanish, this is what we do. We say things, for example, like uh, los libros están en la mesa. You can hear that almost all the syllables count. So we have what is called technically syllable stress le level, syllable level stress, I'm sorry. Versus in English, we have something called word level stress uh, when we stress content words. So we say things like the books are on the table. So you hear books and table mainly. What are, uh, how do we know what to stress in English? By focusing mainly on content words, the main words, which are nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, in interrogatives, demonstrative pronouns, possessive pronouns, negative contractions, and adverbial particles. How do we know what not to stress a lot? Function words, such as articles, personal pronouns, prepositions, conjunctions, demonstrative, adjectives, and auxiliary verbs. So word stress and sentence stress are closely linked. Check, check this out. Overlook, that has the stress on the last syllable. 
if we put this in a phrase, the pattern is tell the cook. So overlook, tell the cook, guarantee, can you see, electrification, we took a vacation, identification, we went to the station. So it's closely link, linked, word stress and sentence stress. As a final exercise, what I want you to do, guys, is practice reading rhymes and full text out loud. We're going to be doing this a lot in, in, in the next two weeks to wrap up the semester. So you can read them silently first, and then you read them out loud, then you record yourself reading them, listen to yourself reading the text, listen to somebody else read, send me the audios. Um, and alternatively, something you could do is go on YouTube, you know, search for a poem, your favorite poem, whatever, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, or whatever poem you like in English, uh, make sure it's on YouTube. And so what you do is you download the poem, practice it, and then compare your recording of that poem against probably a native speaker or a fluent speaker reading it on YouTube. And this will give you a good perspective on whether you're achieving good sentence, uh, sentence stress, and rhythm and intonation. I hope that this is useful and do let me know if you have any further questions. Thank you so very much.